feel like it's so much easier when I have the preset music, guys. But I know if I just kind of went with one tune on there and kind of worked with it, it just wouldn't work all the time. But uh, welcome, welcome, one and all, back to a fine and delicious episode 124 to Jive Talking with Shane Diablo with your host here, Shane Diablo. That's right, it's me. I almost checked to see if I have my sunglasses on top there for a minute. I usually have them up there. Uh, welcome back. I, I am so happy that you're here. I, I miss you. I love you deeply. And um, I appreciate you. A lot of people don't say that to you every day. I appreciate you. I appreciate your being here and spending a little time, quality time, with me. Guys, you guys are seeing backing track right here. Back, pushing back against the backing track stuff. The only reason I'm looking at this is because it says Chuck Billy. When did Chuck, Chuck Billy get in there? I guess Chris Holmes, Wasp, former Wasp, um, and Chuck Billy from Testament, are they're going off about Def Leppard using backing tracks, and Joe Elliott says, well, hold on, mate. Don't you be get all bleeding bloody bullshit on me. So I wanted to see what this is about. So it's not necessarily about backing tracks. I know you guys are sick of hearing about backing tracks. You know, the consensus is, yes, they some use them, yes, it's fine, yes, it's no, it's not fine, never, okay? So we got all that. Joe Elliott pushes back against Chuck Billy's and Chris Holmes's. You know, Chris Holmes could probably use a splash of backing tracks, am I right? I mean, I love the guy, but uh, have you seen the documentary uh, Mean Man? It's wonderful. He's a great guy, he's a wonderful guy. He got fucked by Blackie Lawless, but he could probably use a backing track or two. Chuck Billy and Chris Holmes' Def Leppard backing tracks claim they've got it completely wrong, mate. You got it all wrong. Def Leppard's Joe Elliott has dismissed accusations that his band is using backing tracks during their live performances, saying, We never done that. The 64 year old singer and founding member of the iconic British band um, made the comment while responding to questions about Def Leppard's polished but loose concert in an interview with Stereo Gum. Um, I was going to say before I get kick, kick all into this is that I've been listening to some of that old school pre-pyromania that I never really listened to before. I'm digging that. That's I, I think pyromania would have been the last record where it was just more hard rock, right? And then they got into the mutt lang and all that. Uh, he said in part, I don't normally come, comment on this kind of stuff. But a friend of mine just sent me a link. There's something on YouTube. All recently posted by, recently posting by, forgive me, I don't know his name. Oh, is he throwing shade? I don't know his name. Chuck something from Testament. Oh, I think it is. An ex-wasp, I don't know. I saw the documentary, Mean Man. It's quite nice, but... Uh, Ex-Wasp guitarist Chris Holmes accusing us of using backing tracks. I don't get angry at this. I'm flattered because their standards must be very different to ours. For anybody that thinks we're using backing tracks, mate, it, was, it, it, was, it must mean that when they hear us, they can't believe how bleeding bloody good it is for real. Look... The fact is that if you rehearse the way we do, and they do, they get back there and you can hear them do the, the vocal harmonies when they're back in the green room and the ladies are putting their blouses back on, you know, 50 plus year old lady, blou ladies putting their blouses back on. They're over there in the corner doing all the, you know, pour some sugar on me and all that. Um, the fact is, mate, that if you rehearse the way we do, and you are as talented as the band are as musicians. And maybe you would, be, you would believe it. You would believe it. Well, I'd be happy to invite any of those guys to come stand side stage at a pair of headphones on some of these that could actually hear what's going on off the, on the stage. Jesus. We don't use backing tracks. He reiterated, we use effects. God, who wouldn't? When there are four people singing, we use effects. There's no tapes of backing vocals. We're using keyboards. We use a few drum loops because, in fairness, 
two armed drummers use drum loops, but Rick, in fairness, two armed drummers use drum loops, but Rick Allen, to play a song like Rocket, yeah, it's right? It's a cacophony of toms. That one arm couldn't play. So, yeah, we use a triggered loop, which is part of his drum kit. But you two drummer, Larry Mullen, been doing that for years. So, have thousands of other drummers to enhance the sound. But, but, but backing tracks, or playing along to a backing track, we've never done that. We've never done that, not never. We never mimed to the vocals. Oh, we never had multiples of stuff on tape. It's literally live. If we're running at about 90%, it was the most, uh, it's more than most people's 100%. Because we do play and sing. It does take a toe. Oh, I ain't gonna lie about that. It does take a toe. You can say, play Denver where it's a mile above sea level. And if you've got a gig the next day, your voice is going to be pretty shot. We have to get, what, effects? We have to get to a level where it's a little under last night. It's still acceptable to the audience because of the adrenaline and the fact that it is live and you can hear maybe a bit of hoarseness or somebody's fingers slip up because it's so cold and frigid out there. They can't keep their little mitten fingers. They can't even keep their little fingers on the strings. Things like that happen to every single band, and that's what brings the humanity to it. But we're very proud of the fact that we play live. And we sing live. And we don't use tapes. So, sorry Chuck and Chris Holmes, but you've got, the, this, you've got that one completely wrong. But thanks for thinking that we needed them. We don't. We're that good. Oh, he's throwing some snaps. Thrash bands can't really use backing tracks. Boy, they'd get there'd be trouble, wouldn't there? Some band got up, some you know Exodus got up there and started banging away, and the loop started to skip. Oh, Nikki Six says Motley Crue's music has been described as powerful cross between country and hip hop. What in the Sam hell is going on with them? I need a sip of this, guys. I, my little soda pop. What in the hell is going on? You know, someone put put in the comments somewhere uh, one of the shorts that I did talking about this that. He said, Rock is dead, and I'm starting to think so. You know, you got to start putting country and hip-hop mixed in. You can't even have one or the other. And why does he got an inverted cross on his on his bass guitar? This I'm looking at an image of Nikki Six. if you're not watching along. And he's got an inverted cross on his bass. That is disgusting. That is way more disgusting than... No, it's not. Country and hip hop mix. You know, everyone's going horny for it now because of that that Beyonce song. This ain't Texas. Ooh. This ain't Harlem. And I'm down, 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 down. And Nikki Six just said, "That's what we're doing next, guys." How in the hell's Vince Neil supposed to sing that? Here it is. Nikki Six says that the upcoming music from Motley Crue has been described as a powerful cross between country and hip hop. And he's not making fibs, and it's not an April Fool joke. Guys, look, this is from April 5th, 2024. You can't do April Fool jokes on after the first. You can't. The 65-year-old crew bassist, who is the band's chief songwriter, took to his account on X, the platform formerly known as Twitter, on Thursday, April 4th, to write, presumably, with his tongue firmly in his cheek, Oh, so he's doing a silly. New crew coming around the corner. People who have heard it says it's a powerful cross between country and hip hop. So it, he, he's either being serious or he's being kind of jerky to to Beyonce or something, right? He's not a he's not a bayhead. This fucking guy ain't a bayhead. You too good for Beyonce? She might be single. 
here pretty soon. The way things are looking. Have you been keeping an eye on what's going on over there in P. Diddletown? More than a year ago, Motley Crue recorded three new songs with longtime producer Bob Rock, including Dogs of War, a cover of Beastie Boys, You Gotta Fight for Your Right to Party. There's no way you could do that. I mean, hip hop. Okay. Is Dogs of War the. Uh, that's not a cover, right? That's going to be like a new hit. Because that would be Joe Elliott's. We're fighting for the dogs of war. I bought this bicycle. My, uh, my bicycle that I ride to work, it's got two gears. So I went to Walmart and I bought a bicycle. And they didn't have many to choose from on the rack. And I was hell-bent on getting, not spending more than $100. I did get one for $98, and it is every bit as good as $98 will get you. It is a piece of shit. You just kick yourself. It's weird, because I just want the garbage bike, the gears fixed. And that's a whole new set of things. Oh, you want, yeah, yeah we'll do a overhaul, 180 bucks. What? This past January, Motley Crue guitarist John Five, the five-man John Five Alive, the metal told the Metal Voice uh, that he and his bandmates are continuing to work on fresh material, hot and fresh material. We're writing songs, and new songs will be coming out soon. It's really great, and I'm super excited. Oh, I can't wait. Regarding the musical direction of the new Motley Crue tracks, John Five said, "Oh." Uh, so, so they're being facetious. They're trying to, they're, they're, they want to go, well, now you got to go heavier than Mick Mars, don't you? You can't put out some bullshit country stuff. Because he wins the battle if you do that. Oh, it's heavy. Great songs. Heavy, great songs. I would say you could easily hear this off the Dr. Feelgood album. Earlier in January, John Five, the Five Man, told Illinois Entertainment entertainer about Motley Crue's current songwriting process. Just the other day, Nicky called me and uh, he was playing guitar over the phone and he played a, played a riff um, and and he'll sing the melody and, he, and it sounded like it could be something off of Motley Crue's debut album, Too Fast for Love. Um, it's just natural for him to write these songs that I have loved and lots of other people have loved. Um, I think we're always going to make new music because, man, this is pumping out amazing lyrics. This guy is pumping out amazing lyrics and great music. So the guy gets on the phone with John Five, and he's not a guitar player. So he goes, I'll do Dr. Feelgood, for example. He goes, and then the drums will do this. And, you know, he goes through all that, and then he comes in with whatever... Um, uh, uh, Vince Neil screeches out there in the beginning, and what uh, he says that over the phone, and then John Five turns it into actual riffs. Is that a Nikki Six songwriting credit? Oh, I came up with it all because I hummed it out to you. You you put it together, and then I got something for Vince Neil to screech about. Is that the way that works? I think we're always going to make new music because, man, this guy is pumping out crazy lyrics, great music. When we all get together, it's pretty freaking magical. In December, Motley Crue's drummer Tommy Lee told Desert Sun about the three new songs he and his bandmates recorded with Rock, Bob Rock, producer. Uh, you may know him as the guy that does the Nothing Else Matters and the St. Anger Records. Wait until, wait until you hear it. It's insane. It's not a full album, but that, but, but that might be down the road a bit. We're always writing, doing stuff. So that's always a possibility down the road, because the road's down the road. But we just went to the studio not too long ago and recorded three insane tracks, bro. And one of them is called Dogs of War. We're just finishing up the video for it. <laughs> for those jonesing for some new crew, people are going to bug out. John Five is playing on it. The guitar work is incredible, dude. And it sounds sick. There you have that. 
John Bon Jovi. I want to say something before we get into John Bon, the John man, the John Jovi. We did a video some time back, and I'm, I keep getting comments going, you filthy son of... I, we did a video about John Bon Jovi. We said, what is going on? We didn't know at the time what was going on with John. And to this day, I'm getting comments now that he's come out. says, well, I got throat surgery, this, that, and the other thing, and that's why I sounded that way. At least that's what I think he's going to say. People are putting stuff, I mean, very rude things in the comments. You know? You dirty son of a bitch. He, you know? And I hear it all the time from people, but it's like, I the video's old now, guys. We got to get on to new. Pardon me. Pardon me. Neck has been killing me. Go to school, kids. Go to school. Get an education. Or just make a viral TikTok and then go buy a house in the Bahamas. John the John Bon Jovi on his return to performing live after vocal surgery, which Shane did not know about. It's up to God at this point. He's putting his prayers in God. Uh, you do that right before you go under the knife. Please don't let this guy be having a bad fucking day. Please don't say that his wife called and said, I'm not in love with you anymore and I'm cheating. P not today. And is there anything worse? Because I, when I went in for my colonoscopy, and everyone should go get that. If, you're, if it's your time and you're going, ugh, fucking, I don't ever want to do that. And you start thinking about it at about 40, 44 years old. You start going, i got to do that, but I'm never going to do it. But I should do it, but I'm never going to do it. Just go fucking do it. It's simple, easy. It's almost a pleasure. But what I was going to say, back to the point, is if you've ever had a surgery and the anesthesiologist is the first person you, you know, the nurse takes you down the hall or whatever, but this is the first guy you're going to have a convo with in the surgery room. Every Are every one of them fucking dumb? Like goofy? Like me? Uh, you know, the last time when I went in for my colonoscopy, the guy says, and then they must all say this, but he said, oh, hi, Shane, I'm going to be your bartender today. And I just thought, I love it. And they're going, yeah, bring your cheeks out. No, you got to, yeah, scoot your legs up up more, tighter. Get them un under your tits. Thank you. And then I'm out. I wake up. First thing I say to them, did you check the prostate? Because you want a two for one. If you're going in for the colonoscopy, you got to make sure, you got to demand that they check the prostate while you're in there. So you don't have to go back for another. I digress. John Bon Jovi. In a new interview with Entertainment Tonight, John Bon Jovi. Entertainment Tonight, still around. Who is her name? Mary Hart and John Tesh. John Tesh wrote one piano tune and said, fuck all of you guys. I'm fucking John Tesh, the piano man. John Bon Jovi opened up about the vocal cord deterioration he experienced a few years ago, which caused him to have surgery in 2022. Day to day, I'm working hard on it. And he sounds normal when he's just talking. So it's just when he gets up there in the high range. He's noting that he's uh, hard at work on vocal therapy and, ch and chance he get, any chance he gets. Nothing else matters, matters until I work on getting better. It's up to God at this point. I've done everything I can do. The Bon Jovi front man went on to say that he's giving up, that he isn't giving up, and also assured, I won't fake it. The legacy matters too much. Well, I'm just saying, John, if you need just a splash of help, I won't compromise who or who we are as a band live because I didn't because I'd like to think we're a pretty darn good band. I sang on the new record. I've done music cares and nailed it. I nailed it. When I woke up after that night, it was the first time in a decade the only voice in my head was mine. Fear wasn't there. Doubt wasn't there. And my wife, she wasn't there. Thank God. Oh, wait. 
And my wife, Dorothea, texted the kids and said, He's back, kids. Your daddy's back, kids. Your daddy is back. John previously discussed his vocal injury uh, this past February during a panel about the upcoming jo Bon Jovi docuseries, Thank You, Good Night, The Bon Jovi Story, at the Television's Critics Association Winter Press Tour in Pasadena, California. I pride myself on being a true vocalist. I've sung with Pavarotti. I saw what was his big hit? He was the guy with the big beard and stuff, right? In the 80s, everyone loved him. Even people that never heard fucking classical music in their life, they said, oh, we love Pavarotti. And that was the name you threw out to be fancy. You know, if you're at a fancy dinner, you say, do you have any Pavarotti that we could listen to while we're ha eating these, you know? I know how to sing. I've studied the craft for 40 years. I'm not a stylist who just barks and howls. I know how to sing. So when God was taking away my ability, kind of like Job, and I couldn't understand why, I jokingly said, the only thing that's ever been up my nose is my finger. So there was no reason for this. So he's saying that God was mad at him for not doing cocaine in the 80s. Elaborating on his vocal injury, he said, One of my cords was literally atrophied. So my vocal cords, they're supposed to look parallel. So let's pretend, okay, one of them looks as thick as my thumb, okay, and the other one is as thick as my pinky. Okay, what else? Next step. So the strong one was pushing the weak one, okay, so the strong one's the thumb. I'm going with the thumb for strength. It was pushing the weak one aside, and I wasn't singing well. Hmm. So my craft wasn't being taken. To, so my craft was being taken from me. Fortunately, I found a surgeon who was able to do this really cutting-edge implant to build the cord back. It's still in the process. Now, what happens if that cord is so damn good, you say, Doc, cut the other one out. Cut the other one out and replace it. I could sing, you give love a bad name for another 30 years. Cut that other nasty, you know, piece of flesh out and get those fake ones. While the documentary was being filmed, the singer was unsure he would ever be able to sing professionally again. I say in the film, in the latter episodes... If I just had my tools back, the rest of it I can deal with. He said, according to USA Today, I can write, a so you, I can write you a song. I can, can, I can perform as well as anybody. But I need to get my tools back. Regarding where he stands in his recovery, he said, I'm 19 and a half months into my rehab as of early February and February 2nd at the Music Cares Person of the Year ceremony. It was the first time I'd sung in public. That Saturday morning was the first time I'd woken up without multiple voices in my head. That was the best feeling. It was just me. So I'm working so I'm a work in progress. There you go. Well, bless you, sir. And we, we, you know, there he is. You see the cityscape behind him? That means he's on one of them talk shows, late night talk shows. You know, and he's saying, you wouldn't believe the hell I've been through. Dave Mustaine says that uh, he's, he's been in recommunicado with his sister after 20 years. Now, she might be the one that gave him those black magic books. And he started putting all them curses on everybody. And then he put a curse inside of The Conjuring, a song that's on the second full-length record from Megadeth. Uh, I hope he, she doesn't get him back into black magic. I hope he's learned his lesson. Let's see. Megadeth's Dave Mustaine reconnects with sister after 20 years. Maybe they'll give us a little bit. Dave likes to tell stories. He likes to tell what happens to people and things. So maybe he'll say what is they estranged from. 
Dave Mustaine says that he finally reconnected with his long estranged sister after not having any contact with her for two decades. I can hear it already right now. I gotta write her a song. These last few months have just been magical. I gotta write her a song. The 62-year-old Megadeth lead shared his story on Wednesday, April 10th in honoring in honor of Sibling Day. Siblings Day. Did he reunite because oh he's like oh, I looked at my Siri told me Siri told me that it's Siblings Day coming up. I need to call her. In honor of Siblings Day, a holiday recognized in part in parts of the United States and Canada that celebrate the relationship of brothers and sisters of all ages. Oh, I bet. Oh, I bet there's parts of the country that celebrate the relationships of brothers and sisters. Mustaine took to his account on X, the platform formerly known as Twitter, to write, sharing some words about family in honor of hashtag National Siblings Day. Life's too short not to reach out to loved ones. Which is exactly what I did two days ago. Because he knew National, National Siblings Day. Detailing his surprise conversation with his sister, Dave said, I just got a, I just got a shocking FaceTime video call from my sister, Suzanne. Sadly, mm. she's, she is going to be leaving this earth. Oh, God. Oh, sorry. That just took a left turn. Hmm. She's, she's going to be leaving this earth in the next few days. Dave, you couldn't get a hold of her sooner than just finding out about National Siblings Day? As she is in the, in the grasp of Parkinson's and dementia. Dem, do dementia. Not making jokes about her, guys. Doesn't he say that in the song? A credit to dementia. With a war inside my head. Did he write that song for her? Jesus. And is starting to have her ugh, organ shut down. Jeez. That was hard enough. But the fact that we haven't spoken in probably 20 years is even worse. Imagine my delight to get a FaceTime video from her today, even though she can't speak anymore. Oh, God. Thanks for nothing, Dave. Thanks for nothing. I knew it was her. I just kept telling her how much I love her. And I know she's going to be slipping out of this body and her spirit going to be free soon. Jesus. Uh, oh, I'm just a... F so bizarre National Siblings Day that I would hear from my sister that I haven't spoken to. It, so you didn't bother. She says, oh, can I just dial him up. Dial him up. So you didn't even do it, Dave. I haven't spoken to in so long. In the state of affairs she's currently dealing with, and the fact that even though she didn't want to have anything to do with me growing up because she was a Jehovah's Witness, oh, now it all comes together. He escaped. He left. I kept trying and imagine how happy I am to have seen her phone call today. And not be a butt dial. Well, Dave, she's not in any kind of condition to be butt dialing. My God, do I even want to read this next paragraph. Mustaine and had three older sisters, Michelle, Susan, and Debbie, who were 18, 15, and 3, respectively, when he was born. Due to the significant age difference between Mustaine and his sisters, as a child, he often thought of them as his aunts rather than his sisters. In a 2010 autobiography, Mustaine, a heavy metal memoir, does he read it? I want to, I'll listen to an audiobook if he reads it. Dave wrote about growing up in Los Angeles and being raised by his mother. His parents divorced when he was four. His father was a shadowy figure who was not described fondly to him by his older sisters. 
Mustaine recalled anecdotes of abuse and generally insane behavior perpetuated under the shroud of alcoholism. In March 2020, Mustaine took to Instagram to share that Michelle had passed away. I was truly... Should I do the voice? I you, I don't feel like you're doing the, you should do voices when you talk speak speaking about that. And he wait a minute. So he put this uh, he didn't even type it out. So he puts it up on his he like made a, a JPEG and then he puts his name at the bottom, Dave Mustaine. You could I mean All right. All right, whatever. I was truly lucky to have my sister like her. Rest in peace. My dear Michelle, she had reportedly been battling an undisclosed ailment for a while. Oh, all right, we're leaving. We're leaving. Good news? You want some good news or bad news? He looks more and more like the penguin from Batman every time. That's Marilyn Manson sitting there. And Zoltan Bathory, a uh, guitar player or, or member of Five Finger and the Death Punch, uh, says, good news, there's not, there's not going to be any shenanigans with Marilyn Manson on this concert tour they're going to do. Uh, it's going to be an amazing tour because he's not, he's sober and clean, okay? So he's not going to be doing anything, derailing anything or doing anything like he's done before because now he's, you know, sober and clean. Most people would say clean and sober, but... You go ahead, Zoltan, you go ahead and say it any old way you want. In a new interview with Jessia, Jessia Lee show, Five Finger Death Punch guitarist, you know that now, Zoltan Bathory discussed the band's upcoming tour with Marilyn Manson. The track, which will launch in early August, will mark the Shock Rockers' first live appearance since 2019, Zoltan said as transcribed by Bemmermouth. Manson hasn't been out on the road for a while. So a lot of people want to see him. They want to see him out there. At one point, he was one of the most iconic artists on the planet. So he's back, he's back on stage, back in the saddle. That's going to be amazing. He's also sober and clean. Or clean and sober, however you want to say it. So we always support that. Obviously, Ivan Moody, Five Finger Death Punch singer, had a dark period. And he was gone, man. My little brother was on the brink of dying. Jesus. Man. He came back from that. Oh, good. And he's clean and sober. Wait a minute. Did you just switch it? Because I have, I, you know, I'm just kind of wondering if this is one of them kind of multiverse situations where I keep ragging on you about sober and clean. And then down here, he fixes it. And he's clean and sober for six years. If he can do it, Somebody who was that gone can do it. And he's now a different man. A totally different man. Then it's a good exam example for anyone. If you're struggling, man, don't give up. You can come back from that. And Manson is sober. And he's staying clean. And he went right back to it. Right back to it. You had it right, right there, dude. Clean and sober. And then you go right back. He is sober and he's staying clean and doing the work. So also, we're supporting that, okay? So it's going to be an amazing tour. Manson 30, Manson's 30-date 30 arena amphitheater tour with Five Finger Death Punch is slated to kick off on August 2nd at the Hershey Park Stadium in Hershey, Penn, Penn, Pennsylvania. Over the past three years, we're not going into all of this, but he, he's, he's got some allegations against him. If he's guilty, he needs to do whatever it is. If he's not, over the past three years, Manson has been embroiled in a series of court battles and has been accused by several women, most notably Westworld star Evan Rachel Wood, of sexual, emotional, and physical abuse. I mean... We may have touched on this before, but I feel like if you're going home with Marilyn Manson, you're in trouble already. It's not going to be Captain and Tennille or, you know, it's not going to be, oh, let's make, let's go into the boudoir and make some passionate love. No, it's going to be chains, whips, candle wax on the nipples, you know, bark like a dog type of stuff.
All right. So there you have that. Uh, we do have your uh, your comments coming up, but first I thought we would check in with the uh, Overkill rehearsing uh, with uh, with Dave Ellison. They're going to be doing a Euro tour, I do believe it is. Let's see. Get it to this first paragraph here. Uh, Latin, Latin American 2024 tour. We got it right here. Let's see what's up. Let's see what these guys got. Let's see what they do. Bang. Two. No blitz. So, like, What's he saying back there? You silly goose. You little silly buns. Oh, before we get any further into this, I saw a story too about Overkill members, Exodus members, and Armored Saint members starting up a new band. I'm going, oh, this is pretty cool. And they name it Category 7. Worst band names ever. That's going on the list. I mean, all you got to do is use your imagination and come up with a better fucking name than Category 7? Really? Here we go. Is that, there he is. That's, little, that's David Ellison over there in the corner. What are they going to do? Oh, yeah. No, where's Bobby? I wanted to hear Bobby. Yeah, what is it? Let's keep the call in arms. I want a machine. This is a green, mean green killer machine. Isn't it? Mean green killer machine. Now I got to look, guys. I got to look really quick. Let's see. All right, whatever. We're getting into your comments. Let's get into your comments. Let's see that picture again. There he is with his little chubby cheeks. I can confirm that is overkill, and that is David Ellison right there. And no, Bobby, come on, man. What are you doing? Don't be a lazy bones. I don't want to hear no bands without the singers, okay? It's time for your comments, okay? First up, my God. Mike Buchanan coming in here. And I can spare not a moment, not a single moment on this one. On this week's Movies That Are Bad, but we love them anyways. Night Fright, 1967. I bet you might read that as Fright Night. I was in my mind. I will be watching that one as well. That's, that's a great one. An unidentified object crashes to earth, and a hideous creature is unleashed upon an unsuspecting rural Texas population. When a young couple is found mutilated, Sheriff Clint Crawford, John Agar... He ties into Miss Althea's recommend of the mole people is on the case. With help from his deputy and local reporter, Crawford's local reporter, Crawford searches for clues for what seems like a month. Luckily, monster tracks are found. Then the exhausted search continues. Meanwhile, the town kids, led by troublemaker Rex Bauer, Frank Jolly, if you don't know who he is, have decided to have a dance in down at the beach. Yeah, of course. When you have the monster loose, you gotta go down and chill at the beach. In spite of Crawford's warning, Sheriff Crawford saying, don't fucking go down to the beach. What did uh, Roy Schneider say in Jaws? Don't go down to the beach. Don't go down. They go anyways. They do it anyways. There they go. Dancing like the carefree 30-year-old kids that they are. So they had, like, yeah, actors that weren't really kids. Wasn't there supposed to be a monster of some sort in this movie, question mark? More dancing commences. Finally, the beast attacks in full. Obscured sight. As the hairy horror approached, the kids dance on. Grab your favorite beverage. Sit in your favorite chair, pop some popcorn, and press play. 
I'm gonna. I think I'm gonna watch that. Who doesn't love a good fucking dance party? Name me one person that doesn't love a good dance, going and standing at a dance, because no one will ask you to dance. Of course not. Even if you're standing there, kind of moving back and forth. You know, maybe tapping a toe, you do a spin every once in a while to kind of show them, I do have skills if you want If you want to dance. No, you just sit there the whole time. Even when the song, I want to dance with somebody comes on, you still don't get a dance. You still don't get a dance. Dude. I am so down with live video movie watching. I've seen pages on YouTube where they do a live stream. They don't actually show the movie, but they are watching it while the viewers at home are also watching it. This way, this way, way they don't get in trouble for streaming copyright movies. I'm sure something can be figured out. Yeah, just more thinking on that. You know, I do at some point, you know, I, I always dream of doing like a stream, like a daily or a, you know, like a, like I always love the radio. I always love that kind of morning, morning show thing, you know, so it would be nice to do something where every morning it's like, there it is. I don't got nothing to do with my life. Um, Mike Buchanan on Trent, Trent Resman, the resonator. I say yes and no on the streaming thing. If the streaming sites would provide artists with a better compensation other than cents or percents of cents, yes, on the dollar instead of making billions of dollars, yes, artists would be making a living. But don't most artists make most of their money from touring and merchandise? Question mark. Now, that being said, streaming has helped that, that unknown artists to the front so that people like you and I can hear them. That's where I like. That's what I agree with. Man, you, there could be a band right now that you say, this band is just as good as Metallica. And there's five people following them on St Spotify. We don't even know where they're at yet. That's exciting to me. Otherwise, they would be lost in the, in the back of the CD bin to time. Yeah. And they wouldn't, 99, 95% of them wouldn't even be on a CD bin shelf. Unless it's some kind of used CDs where they buy your CDs for cheap. Mike Buchanan on Wolf. Listen, AI is here and here to stay. Either we get on board or our new overlords will take offense. Bow down now and respect to our mighty lords. Thank you. Yes. You got to get in good with the AI so you can tattle on everyone else. Say, remember, I was here. I, I was I was with you guys right out of the gate. Same with the aliens. I'm on your side, guys. What are we doing? We killing? We 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 farming them? What are we doing? Because I'm with you. If you if you let me live on the ship, give me a nice little sponge pad to sit on, some sort by the by the ruler. Cool. Um. Mike Buchanan on KISS. Look, I'm not saying they're money hungry, but they're money hungry. I will not be seeing an Avatar KISS show. I'll wait for the YouTube video. Mike Buchanan on Rex Brown. While I'm not the biggest Pantera fan, I myself prefer the hair metal years, I would welcome new music from that band. Okay, there you go. Mike Buchanan on Living Color. First off, I saw them open for Extreme last year. There's a great combo. That would be a great combo show. Amazing show, see? I said it was great. He said it was amazing. I would love to hear new music from the band. Oh, and I almost took a job with UPS. Glad I didn't. I mean, my comedy career took off after that. Trust me. Your comedy career? Okay. I don't know. I'm lost. Uh, Mike Buchanan says, Ace needs his own TV show. I, yes. I'd watch the shit out of that. Dude, if I was a famous musician, I'd go to stores at random at random, and autograph my band's CDs. That would be, that's so great. People do stuff like that. Like uh, that, was it Banksy that takes paintings out of a thrift store and then paints into them? 
and then puts them back. There's somebody that does that, and it's like someone picks it up. Uh, you know, they go to the thrift store, and they're like, this is like four bucks. And they buy it, and then they go, hold on, buddy. That's worth 40,000 bucks. I love that kind of stuff. And now, your job talking jokes of the week. What do you call a detective who just solves cases accidentally? Sheer luck, Holmes. I was told I could look at the eclipse through a, a colander. Through a colander. I tried it, but it strained my eyes. I don't know what a colander is. I had a safety meeting at work. They asked me what steps I'd take in a fire. Apparently, really big, fast ones was the wrong answer. That's a good one. It's the ice cream truck. Be right back. Oh, did was there like a real ice cream truck? You ran out to grab something? Okay, I'm back. Got one of those orange and cream bars. Those are good. Uh, yeah, the, but it's got the real vanilla ice cream in it is what makes it better than... I, I like the vanilla part more than the orange part, but they blend quite nicely together. My wife has been missing for six days now. Police said to prepare for the worst, so I went to the charity shop to get her clothes back. Oh, that's good. And finally, so I did a blood test on a garden frog to extract its DNA and confirm its identity. I discovered the frog was 70% British, 20% French, 7% Italian, 2% Dutch, and a tadpole. Ah, yeah. See, it's, it's slung in there right at the very end. Kabang. Fantastic. There you go. Our, our wonderful pal Oscar coming in. UPS pays $42 an hour in Washington State for entry-level positions. Damn. Wow. I couldn't even imagine. I couldn't even fa fathom 42 bucks an hour. It would It's just out of my realm. Corey Glover could make more money working for this outfit than... Okay, so he's talking about the UPS of Corey Glover. UPS pays $42 an hour in Washington State for entry-level positions. Corey Glover could make more money working for this outfit than playing Special Olympics crowds at Disneyland. Yeah, we did that video where he went over and got himself a big old turkey leg. Right in the middle of Cult of Personality, he walks over. Look in my eyes, what do you see? And I think if you go find that video, Living Color actually commented. I think we pinned it. There you go, buddy. Very good. Uh, with the diversity mandates out here, he gets to cut in front. Of, oh, boy. In front of the line like those fast passes where you pay extra and bribe in order to get first in line. God bless America. Oh, Oscar. All right. Take a few deep breaths there, okay? This is the fun zone. Um, Miss Althea coming in. Trent Reznor, as she's talking Trent Reznor here, when did he start looking like Luke Wilson? Is it the nose? I understand where he's coming from, and I totally understand your own explanation slash argument. One and done with the money for a CD in hand versus money trickle for every streaming play. The way of technology, while, uh, while unavoidable, is a little lost on me as I am of the generation that will and does still carry around a CD player. I prefer and appreciate the actual in-hand product. Some CD packaging is truly art, and I love that. Yes, I agree. You simply and obviously don't get that with the streaming only platforms. And that is very true. You don't get the all the I mean that's what you grew up on, right? You'd sit down, you listen, you turn on the record track 1 and then you look at all the liner notes, you read all the lyrics with every single song. So there is that. Uh, and don't apologize for your pop-up rant about work and don't feel like you're 
Your brawn is not appreciated. There is a ton of shit I could never get done myself if it weren't for guys like you. And trust me, I am in the realm of office administration. The biz politics aren't any different on, on the other side of the fence. Yes. Miss Althea on Wolf Hoffman. Uns, that's the guy from Accept, you know. He's concerned about AI. Yeah, what happened uh, to talking to local locals for restaurant recommendations? Yeah, because uh, last episode, Wolf was saying he, you know, he gets on his Google to find it, uh, Indian restaurants, and we said, well, just fucking walk around the neighborhood, you might find one. So he says, yeah, what happened to talking to the locals for restaurant recommendations? God forbid anyone forsake Siri or Google and favor actual human interaction. And it's going to get a whole lot worse. You know, I could picture a time where everyone is so far. You see those helmets they're wearing now? I can picture a time where it is silent outside, but the streets are packed. You're seeing, you're seeing the, what's the big place in New York City? Times Square. And there's thousands and thousands of people and you can hear the birds chirping. Are there birds there? You'll hear the rats chirping. I don't think they have many trees other than the parks. Uh, Google for interactions. And with the whole AI in the realm of music debate, I was totally overlooking a prime example of this. One which should have been totally obvious to me from the get-go. The topic can go back to the late 90s. There was a song Hide was working on when he passed away in May 1998. Kogal. C-O space G-A-L, Kogal, was supposed to be a promo single for what became his third solo album. It was left as an uncompleted demo, but after his passing, his right-hand man, I-N-A, that's the guy's name, I.N.A, used an early version of AI technology to replicate Hide's voice on the verses that had not yet been recorded by Hide himself. The process took two years. The single was finally officially released in 2014 after working through some legalities. Sixteen years after Hide's passing, it reached number two on the Japanese music charts. Fans lost their shit when it dropped. It was a second coming. So, yeah. Who was it? Oh, it was the Beatles that did that. Remember, they just they put uh, John Lennon and all of them back in a, in a song using that. Miss Althea on Kiss, no comment. Hilarity ensues amongst your sub-viewers comment uh, community at large who know how vocal I can be otherwise about crap like this. Rex Brown, Miss Althea Rex Brown and Pantera in general, why thoughts and pr my thoughts and prayers are with the Abbott family on yet another loss, because the father passed away. Hearing that Dime and Vinny's father was only a couple of years younger than my own, who passed away in November, really got to me. Rest in peace. Now, oh, there you go. Miss out the on Living Color. The sad song you were thinking of was Open Letter to a Landlord. Yep. I don't remember a lick of it. Unless it says, I got an open letter for the landlord. Would that be an eviction notice? An open letter from a landlord? It sure as hell isn't good news. You're getting a month free. You've been such a uh, wonderful... You know, 15 years in the apartment, and then we raise the rent and then kick you out on the streets. Well, you know, that's life. Uh, open letter to the landlord. And thanks, Corey, for making me overthink, uh, overthink various ways to parody Cult of Personality or Glamour Boys in relation to UPS. Miss Althea on Ace. He has a boat that fits five people. Yet he has punked out on his mortgage for how many years? Very good. I forgot about that. And she says, okay. And I will never look at a Walmart the same way again. Very good, very good. There's your heart, Miss Althea. Dr. Frosty Brew. He's a fun guy. Not like a fungus. He's a fun guy. Dr. Frosty Brew. 
They are now saying the KISS catalog sold was only from 1989 to current. Universal Music owns the classic KISS catalog. Who'd want that for three million, three hundred million? I mean, we love Eric Carr, I'll give you that, but really? That much money for just 1989 to Sonic Boom? I say you give me the gravy. You gave me the meat and potatoes or we're not doing the deal. That's what I would have said. But this is a guy, you know, this is, this is a, you're, you're, you're listening to a man that just bought a $98 bicycle at Walmart. It's a piece of shit and he's got to drive it now. So, you know, no one's going to let me be in charge of their fucking music catalog. There you go. There's your heart. Anthony uh, coming in here. Uh, Atticus has brought a boringness to Trent Reznor that I don't really appreciate. I don't know. The soundtrack work is a great career. However, I question, dot, 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 does it really speak from Reznor's heart or does he owe Ross something? That's very good because the stuff that I have heard recently from him, like he put out those two really boring piano records or whatever, I want to hear... Pretty Hate Machine again. Wish. All of that stuff. I want to hear that again. What was that song? Hey, little bit of big, big pig. Just, you know, give me the, give me, give, res me up, res, resner. There's your heart, my good friend. Jolly Jake Lavelle coming in. I love this gospel R&B flavored cold opening you had going on there, Shane. Thank you. I, I appreciate it when, when well-wishers wish me well on these songs that I do because they're very difficult. There's a lot, there's, you know, it, it might sound like random noise to you, what you're thinking, but it's not. It's, you know. And maybe in the future, just like Shakespeare, how we love him so much now, maybe my horrible things will be like, oh my God, it was absolute musical genius what he was doing. It just blows us away in 2123. I said, we're going back to the old shit. Where are you going? Well, when they blew up all the catalogs of music, all we had left was Shane's intros for his jive talking. So we listen to that every day, and it's just great. It never gets old. All right. Well, let's see if we can find a... I want to find a tune, guys. I, I need to find a tune. Turn the damn buttons on first. Sure you can. Yes, I'll allow you to. Baby, baby, baby. 